Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I, I will spare uh, Christiana and Tom the kind of usual uh, long formal introduction, uh, given this um, um, lovely intimate setting of Zoom. Uh, but su su suffice to say, they are um, not only highly distinguished, but uh, also, if I may add, uh, personal heroes of mine. Uh, Christiana Figueres and, and Tom Rivet Karnak are irrepressible climate optimists uh, and worked, of course, closely together under Christiana's executive. Uh, secretaryship of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to deliver the uh, 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement, which is widely credited as one of the most extraordinary uh, diplomatic achievements uh, of our age. And, and one, of course, that many thought were, were, was impossible uh, and unobtainable. Uh, since leaving, leaving the UNFCCC, uh, they have co-founded an organization called Climate Optimism, uh, forgive me, Global Optimism, um, whose mission is to engage with various organizations and initiatives to uh, really push forward this critical goal of net zero uh, no later than 2050 and preferably uh, a lot before that. Uh, they also co-host a, a very entertaining and inspiring podcast uh, appropriately called Outrage and Optimism, uh, which I warmly recommend to uh, anybody listening today. Uh, but, but they're here today to, to talk about uh, the book they recently co-authored together, and entitled A Future We Choose. So Christiana and Tom, thank you very, very much for uh, giving us your time this afternoon. And I, I'd love to, to hand over to you to talk to us a little bit about um, the inspiration behind the book and, um, and, 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 and what, you have, um, what you have written in it. Right. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to join in this conversation, both from uh, Tom and myself. Um, a quick presentation of the book. I, I would say the, the book is basically um, premised on two foundational pillars. The first is science, which we now know from COVID is actually primordial to any decisions that we take. Um, and the science piece of this book uh, is the fact that we do have to decarbonize the global economy to net zero by 2050, but way before that, to one half of the greenhouse gases emit emitted um, globally by 2030. We have to cut our emissions in half if we want to have a standing chance of living in a better world than what we do today versus a much worse world of constant destruction and human misery. What that actually means is that we've already moved into the decisive decade of the history of humanity, which could sound like an exaggeration, but it's not because it is in this decade that we're deciding which way we're gonna go, on to build a much better world or catapult ourselves into a much worse world. So that is the first premise of the book. The second premise of the book is that we have incredible human agency. We are making a choice, consciously or unconsciously, but we collectively as humans are making a choice as to what our future is going to be. Our future personally of those who are alive now, but especially the future of many generations to come who will not have that choice because the choice is being made now. And the corollary to that is that we have the agency to make the right choice. That's the exciting part. We can actually make the right choice to move toward a much better world. And we explain that one of the first steps of that is to change our mindset toward, among other things, something that we call stubborn optimism, which is optimistically choosing, making the decision every single day that we're going to be optimistic about our capacity to make the changes that are necessary and be stubborn about it, be gritty, be determined, barrier after barrier, just keep on going until we get there. Now, we did write this book before COVID hit. And what has been fascinating for us is to look at how the scenario that we paint there of a much worse world, there are already many evidences in our COVID, current 2020 COVID world that are already awesomely, um, quite unnervingly, I would say, unnervingly similar to what we describe in the book. However, the other piece is also true 
because what COVID is doing is it is accelerating many of the issues that we discuss in the book and that are going to impact on your investment decisions. So let me just quickly point out a couple. We are moving from consumption of goods being the operating principle of human behavior into access to services. So we are dematerializing. Think of transport, think of um, energy, how we are dematerializing energy. Energy used to be solid as in coal or liquid as in the other fossil fuels. That is being dematerialized. Consumption of other services like, uh, or consumption of other goods like transport, we used to depend on a vehicle that we owned. Well, we're now moving towards service uh, uh, being, uh, transport being a service. So very interesting how we're beginning to dematerialize. We're also changing the extraction model that we talk about in the book, when that is mor morphing into what we could call the optimization of resources so that we're no longer extracting, using, and wasting or discarding. We're actually optimizing the resources that we have at hand and using them not once, but many times in order to move toward a circular economy. We're also, and I think this is quite historical for the finance uh, for the finance sector, we're moving out of the shareholder primacy. Thank you, Milton Friedman, for what you did 75 years ago, but it's simply no longer tolerated either by the public or by markets. Um, the consideration of environmental and social impact is actually now increasingly, or I should say exponentially, determining value of assets. And, um, and that is a very clear trend that we're seeing that we're now morphing into stakeholder and long-term benefit where the environment and social impacts are recognized as, um, as active as the um, shareholder or the profit um, of any company. And any company has already been shown during COVID and before, but especially now in the next um, five to 10 years, any company or corporation that is not contributing to environmental and social solutions will simply not be able to perform as well as those that are contributing. Ironically, though we are moving much more into long-term benefit analysis, the speed of change is increasing. So we are moving into an exponential world and you know, the meaning and the understanding of exponential has just exploded in front of us with, uh, with COVID and exponential is no longer an exception that we say, well, this and this sector is moving exponentially. It is actually becoming very quickly preponderant in most sectors. And so all of that, just to show you that the human agency that we talk about in the book about us, not just making the choice, but being entirely capable of making the right choice is actually based on these trends that we're seeing in acceleration right now in this remarkable 2020 year. And all of which will be impacting your investment decisions today and tomorrow. Tom, over to you. No, that was fantastic. Thank you. So I'm, I, I'm going to dive in and fill in the very few gaps that I can still see. But I would just pay my co-author a compliment before I begin, which is I must have heard Christiana. Christiana and I have talked about the book together maybe a hundred times. I have never heard her describe the book in the same way twice, which is brilliant. It's always brilliant. It's always intuitive and it's always fantastic. I love it. So um, I thought that was great and really focused on the sort of the investment case and what's needed now and the real uniqueness of this particular moment. The only other piece that I would add is that we really wanted to write a book that was targeted at all of us in all of our individual roles as human beings, right? So, you know, we all have roles, yes, as consumers, but also as citizens, as parents, as employees, as voters, et cetera, et cetera, all of the different roles. And how, how we take action to engage with this moment is a kind of non-trivial challenge for us. Christiana said at the beginning of what she talked about there, that this is the most consequential decade humanity has ever faced. And how we respond to this in the next 10 years will determine the future of life on Earth for at least several hundred years after that. Now, that's quite a lot, 
right, for us to understand and get into our heads, particularly when it's not clear what we do as a result of that information in order to make the right change. So we break that down in the book, but we do it in a different kind of way, we think, to how it's ever been done before. So just three broad areas that we discuss. The first, which I think makes the book quite unusual, and Christiana talked about this, is how we show up as human beings. Yes, it's a frightening time to be alive and things are changing fast and we're seeing new phenomena that we haven't seen before, like an entire side of a continent on fire. And if any of you have had a Zoom call with a friend in San Francisco in the last two or three days, but it's terrifying to see the color of the sky over there. And this is just a few months after Australia and the Amazon and the Arctic and Bulgaria and Greece and that, that terrible migrant camp in Greece. Not everything is directly connected to climate change, but it's all made much more likely because of it. So what we say in the book is we have to meet, we have to ride out to meet this moment. There's a tendency to say, oh, it's all too difficult and it's all too much. We have more of an impact on the future of life on earth in the next 10 years than any generation that has lived and possibly any generation in the future because we may pass the point at which we can do this. We need to meet that with a sense of courage and determination and this gritty, realistic, stubborn optimism that actually makes us take every action that we can. Far from the sort of luxury of feeling powerless that we've indulged in, we need to realize the power and the potential that we have. If anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be us. There's nobody else who's gonna turn up and solve this for us. It's gonna be those of us who are in the positions of making decisions right now, and that's all of us. So that's the first bucket of things. How do we show up? How do we find the courage in ourselves to show up? The second bucket is, how do I take responsibility for my own life? Some people say that it doesn't really have that much of an impact kind of what I do in my own emissions. That's not true for two reasons. One is it can actually be quite considerable when lots of people get involved in changing their lives. And secondly, if you get involved in that, if you change the way your energy is used, change the way you eat meat, change a whole variety of other details about your life, it will make it much more likely that you'll feel engaged in this issue and you're participating in it and you can actually be part of making a major change. So what we say is, in the course of the next 10 years, we have to reduce emissions by at least 50%. So each of us individually should do the same. And actually we tend to overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in 10 years. With planning and investment and a decision to actually go ahead and do that, that's enough time to change the capital intensive items in your life, to in some cases change the pattern of your life. Christiana and I started this podcast that Michael was kind enough to call out Outrage and Optimism, which is about when one of the reasons we've done that is so we don't have to travel around the world in order to talk to people about this issue. Not that traveling around the world is an issue now anyway. Excuse me. And then the final thing I'd say is about how we engage with power. That's the third bucket of how we all need to engage. This is as a voter, it's as a to, to our governments, it's as a consumer to companies, it's as an employee to ensure that the companies that we work for are right on the cutting edge of what is needed and the transformation that's necessary. So in each of those ways, how we show up, how we take responsibility for ourselves and how we engage with power, we all have an enormous responsibility in this most decisive decade. And the book is about empowering people, helping them feel that and helping them know how to go out and make a real change. So I look forward to the discussion. Great, well, um, thank you both uh, very much for a fantastic introduction. Um, uh, we'll open it. Um, up now to uh, Q and A, um, and so if if you if uh, participants look in the bottom right hand um, uh, corner of your screen, there's a button for Q and A, and you can um, enter any questions that you might have for uh, Christiana and Tom there. But um, while we're thinking about that, I'll start with one of my own. Um, so um, I, I, so this is sort of coming at it from a slightly oblique angle, but as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of your podcast, and you recently had Rebecca Solnit. Uh, come to, to speak to you. And she had this wonderful phrase, which really kind of stuck with me. And she said that um, um, in, in, in some cases, despair is a luxury good. I thought this was a really interesting tie in to this idea that, that kind of that, that you really hammer home in the book about gritty optimism. And I just wonder if you could share with some share with us some insights around the, in, in terms of your own careers to date, and in terms of bringing people with you, which has been a very um, signature aspect of both the diplomacy you've done and now through, through, through global optimism. You know, what lessons you've learned uh, around that collaborative approach and, and, um, and what are the main challenges for us to consider as investors you know, as we you know, hopefully try to go down that path ourselves and, and bring people with us in, in terms of um, the positive impact of um, investing rather than some of the kind of negative exclusionary uh, processes that may have uh, predominated in the past. 
Um, well, well, if I can jump in. Um, first, I think we have to show up, as Tom calls it so nicely, we have to show up with huge respect for wherever anyone is. We're all in a different place on these things. So first of all, no judgment, because some are in deep despair, others are in, you know, just revolutionary anger, others are in la-la land and denial of science, you know, I mean, just across the board. So first, you know, recognize that there is a huge diversity of where everyone is. Having done that, the next step is, okay, no judgment, no blaming, and however, how do we move forward? Because when Rebecca says, you know, we don't have the luxury of despair, what she means is, we don't have the luxury of falling into a box of paralysis of no action. This is one challenge that humanity simply cannot afford to be blind to or to be indifferent to. If, of course, we have any intention of staying on this planet as a human race that thrives. Now, if our collective intent is to say, okay, we were here for a couple of thousand years, but it's now time to leave. Well, then that's different. But if there's any intent to stay here because the planet will continue, she's quite happy without us. She's, you know, she was without us for 4.5 billion years, just perfectly capable of taking care of herself without us. So it has nothing to do with the planet per se. It has nothing to do with the evolution of the planet. It has to do with the evolution of the planet with respect to the very, very narrow set of conditions that allow human beings to prosper, thrive, and multiply ourselves. Um, and that is what we're protecting. And so that's what she means when she says, you know, we don't have the luxury of despair. She's not she's not being dismissive of despair because in that sense, we have to understand that we all have moments of despair, honestly, right? I mean, you wake up in the morning, you see the news and please tell me, you know, who doesn't have at least three thoughts of despair before you have your first cup of coffee or tea. So it's not that we shouldn't make room for that. It's that we can't afford to stay there. And certainly not if paralysis sets in. And you asked, you know, about our experience. Well, Tom and I started working at the United Nations um, just six months after Copenhagen when there was utter despair about climate change and about the negotiations. And no one ever believed that we would ever be able to get a global agreement on how do we decarbonize the global economy. And so that was the, the context in which we were thrown into this process. And um, we did have to first change our own mindset here and say, wait, 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 yes, we're in pain. We're Copenhagen survivors, but can we afford to stay in this hole? No, we have to get out of it. And the first thing is to change your mindset and say, yes, huge pain, but we can move forward. And so we did. And over, you know, several years, we brought um, the necessary number of people in the necessary places to make decisions that were critical in order to get an agreement. But our point is that mindset really determines what you deem possible and what you make possible. So this is not about accepting that it is impossible to address climate change. If that seems like an impossibility to you, the challenge here is to accept the difficulties, but work to make it possible. Can I just jump in on that as well? Because I think it's a, it's a really good question. So, um, and, and I mean, what a way with words Rebecca Solnit has. My favorite quote from that episode of the podcast, which she said, that our job is to gently take away the teddy bear of despair from people's loving arms, which I thought was just full of such amazing compassion and insight that, you know, the teddy bear of despair from loving arms, right? People are attached to that and it's a way that people can feel secure. So we shouldn't disparage that in any way. But I would point to um, the definition that Christiana and I use of optimism, which is to some degree counter definitional to how some people's understanding of optimism is. We don't think of optimism as a belief that everything's going to be all right, or as a sort of assumption that it's all going to kind of turn out on the right, all right on the night, kind of a soft acquiescence to whatever is going to be. Um, we, and I learned from Christiana in The Road to Paris that actually optimism is a strategy to transform a difficult situation. And it's always been most relevant when the outlook is the darkest. 
In many cases, when there's been a very difficult situation, people have said, I will refuse to submit to the idea that it's impossible to solve this and I will dig in and I will find a way. And that creates a beacon of possibility that actually draws people to that. That's what we mean by this kind of gritty, realistic, determined, stubborn optimism that you can actually decide that you're gonna grab hold of that. It's not dependent on thinking that everything's going great or even that it's likely that you'll be successful, but it's a choice that you're gonna do everything you can with the limited time and resources that you have to affect the outcome that you want. And all of us have the chance to choose that if we want to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a question from my uh, colleague, Johnny Greenhill, who uh, says, thank you very much. Very fascinating. Um, on the topic of agency, uh, please may you elaborate on what companies can do to get beyond greenwash and instead devise truly meaningful approaches to addressing climate change. Any comments on global optimism's work with Amazon, for example? Well, I, I think first, you know, very much in the in the vein and the spirit of our previous answer to, to the question, um, the acceptance that every corporation is in a different place um, and no judgment here. Everyone has been doing, you know, whatever they've been doing in the past. Um, but while we do not judge the past, there is a huge expectation that now that we have the science, now that we have the facts, now that we have the technology, the capital, and we know what the policies are, now we really have to change things. So whatever happened in the past, and, and you could use the argument also for the culpability, culpability in quotation marks, or the responsibility of industrialized countries versus developing countries, same issue. Yes, the industrialized countries bear the, the responsibility of historically having produced climate change. Now, do we hold them responsible and blame them and make them feel guilty the rest of their existence? No, because that doesn't bring them along. So accept what has happened. Um, accept that you, there's no way that you can walk back into the past and change that reality. But of high expectations and accountability of what corporations, countries, citizens, investors are now doing into the future, because now we really do know. And so for us, that is, um, that is our expectation of everyone. We have no tolerance for greenwashing whatsoever. Frankly, there is no space and there's no time for greenwashing. And the markets are actually being able to differentiate that. You know, we are seeing that companies that are truly engaging here and are being so much more responsible with climate change, with in the social inclusion, with racial issues, all of that, the whole, you know, gamut of social and environmental issues are performing better. Um, and that's because their clients are expecting that um, and because the markets are reacting to that. So it's very interesting. And you know, the, the last big proof of that was BP when Beyond Petroleum uh, used to be called um, Beyond Petroleum, British Petroleum. Um, I, I still love Beyond Petroleum. I think they're gonna come back to the Beyond Petroleum uh, tagline. But um, when they decided under the new CEO to leave 40% of the oil and gas reserves that they have to leave them untapped in the ground um, and to cut dividends and invest into renewable energy. Any person thinking in the previous paradigm would have said they are completely crazy. You know, their stock value is going to crash. Their, you know, their, their shareholders are really gonna punish them. No, the, the stock actually went up by seven points in 24 hours. Why? Because responsibility, environmental responsibility and social responsibility is so much more frontline now both in the public as users and clients, but also um, as, um, as investors and shareholders. Yeah, I mean, I think you've given a great answer. I mean, you know, I think that um, you, 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 you need to be quite clear with corporations. I mean, I would say you need to set a science-based target that sets where you're going to actually go if you're serious about doing that. You need to have short-term targets that are within the time frame of the senior management. You need to align the incentives of the senior management team to the outcome that's based on this with regard to climate. You need to have proper and honest measurement that's ideally verified from a third party. And you need to have humility, realize you don't know every step and that you'll partner along the way to find the answers. And I think if a plan has all of those different components, then I think you can be pretty sure that the people who put it in place are serious about it. And I mean, as far as Amazon goes, and Christiana said this publicly, 
we did our due diligence, right? When Jeff Bezos first called Christiana, we were like, well, let's take a look at this. And we asked some tough questions and we did our research. And, and we're, we're convinced that they're serious and they're not doing everything perfectly. And no doubt they will make mistakes that will, that will get in the press, I'm sure. But, you know, we are, we are convinced of his intention to do this right. And that's what counts. Uh, I wonder if we could turn um, briefly and topically to the, to the, the finance industry. And you've um, both had um, many dealings with, uh, with the industry. Tom, in particular, you've had many advisory roles. Uh, it's brought you into close contact with the investment industry. I, I guess, are there any um, standout examples that you'd um, uh, suggest to us of um, either organizations or initiatives that, uh, that, that, that you think are perhaps the kind of gold standard for um, the way that investment firms um, could aspire to direct themselves in future? And, and then I guess the, the, the reverse of that, and just very bluntly, where is it that you think that, that finance is still failing woefully? Where can we get mm. better? So... Christiana will have answers to these as well, I'm sure. So I'll give you just one example of the first one. I mean, I think, and obviously the finance world has so many different component parts of it, right? So they may not be relevant specifically to this area, but I do think the Asset Owners Alliance is a game changer. So I'm sure you know about this, but the collection of asset owners that came together to make a firm commitment that they would decarbonize their entire portfolios by 2050 with a pathway to doing so and are engaging very seriously in what that pathway looks like, what that would require of asset managers, what types of investments they're looking at, how they track and measure that. I mean, that's still gathering momentum in terms of the impl implementation of what that really looks like. But I think that that will have a major impact on the sector, particularly if sovereigns start to get involved in a major way, which I think is likely that they'll do. Um, in terms of the second piece, um, as a, for sort of a, a quite a different area of the finance world, <coughs> Christiana and I used to have a position with a group called the Global Covenant of Mayors. And through that, had direct access and direct experience of many thousands, tens of thousands of mayors around the world. Excuse me. <coughs> and I know it's a very suspicious dry cough, but I don't think it's COVID. Yeah, and Tom, um, you're yeah, having no, a no, coughing. No. <laughs> um, and what we saw there was particularly in developing economies, but not only, that many cities had really strong views about the future transformation of their infrastructure and that they wanted to invest in clean infrastructure. They understood that their future competitiveness depended on, you know, the right kind of infrastructure as well as, you know, broadband and other things. And in some cases, you know, they had a good plan for how they would pay that back. But private equity firms and others didn't really have the model under which they could engage properly with those cities in order to help them develop their investable plans and work with them to implement them. And it seemed that there was just so many moving pieces and they weren't acting together well enough to really make that happen. I'm now gonna go on mute and have a coughing fit and hand over to Cristiano. <laughs> Michael, um, you have another question from Paulina in the question and answer column if you want to go to that. Um. I can only see I can only see one question on mine so it may be Christiana that you can see more than I can um, okay in, in okay case, I'll please, read the please. question I'll Thank read the you. question in a minute but I, I just wanted to um to um, uh, compliment what Tom has said about the asset owner alliance that there is interest mounting interest in making something similar for asset managers so, um, you know, please take a note of that because uh, there is that um, interest bubbling up of the enlightened asset managers who realize that time is up and uh, that together they can learn so much more, although impact investment is really moving forward very quickly. But, um, but how to do that uh, uh, together as a um, pre-competitive space in a pre-competitive space um, and share lessons learned is one way to accelerate that transformation. So um, any interest in being part of a burgeoning asset manager alliance, um, please take note. Um, but I can, I can do um, Michael's job and, um, and read out another question that appears to me anyway. So Michael, the question is from Polina Slibinska, who says, along the lines of Michael's question, stubborn optimism brings to mind persevere, the motto of Leith, 
where I currently live and historically is somewhat rough around the edges port area that is today being rapidly gentrified. It strikes me that privileged, well-off Westerners like myself and likely the majority of investment professionals probably have not really had the life experiences to teach us how to cultivate grit and perseverance to the same extent. Who do you think we could learn from? Whose example should we look to in learning how to be stubborn optimists? What a good question, because it's a question of privilege, right? Um, and so the, the question is, um, can, can we continue to live, afford to live in a privilege bubble um, and just sit back and wait for somebody else to take responsibility? Well, I actually think, and I'm sorry to pull out my morality card here, um, but I actually think that it is precisely those who have this privilege who have the major responsibility. Because usually, not always, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship there, but privilege is somewhat correlated to the size of the table that you sit at, the decision table, right? And so it, it, in as much as that may be true, that you're privileged and therefore you sit at higher and higher and bigger and bigger decision tables, meaning your decisions have a higher impact. So you have more of a responsibility. And I certainly hope I have enough trust in humanity that I do not believe that all humans need to have the experience of misery um, before we can decide to do the right thing. I'm hoping that we can look out there and see, and I'm hoping that COVID is actually giving us that lesson. We don't all have to fall into uh, the, in the um, intensive care unit, uh, literally of COVID or figuratively of climate change. We don't all have to fall into that intensive care unit until we understand that we actually have to go out there in the world and make the changes that are necessary to prevent the whole of humanity having to rush for the intensive care unit. So, you know, I, I take some hope from, um, from this COVID thing because it is, it is really showing us that very sadly, we do have 900,000 deaths, if I have that number correctly, around the world. Um, and we have many more people who have been in the intensive care unit. But that doesn't mean that all the rest of us have been irresponsible. Actually, we've been able to tap into our responsibility and act as responsible citizens. And so let's extend that. Let's extend that responsibility to climate change. Because if COVID has made absolute, you know, has caused disasters around the economy. You just wait until we're hit with the worst effects of climate change. It will make COVID look like the playground. And so, you know, let us understand and take this lesson and say, no, we don't all have to be at the bottom of misery in order to stand up to our responsibility. That is what the book is calling to, for. The book is calling for each of us in our personal roles, in our professional roles, in our political roles, in our corporate roles, to stand up to who we know we are and what agency we have, to stand up to what I could call our better selves and take that responsibility seriously and in a timely fashion. Because if you take the responsibility 10 years from now, my friends, it's too late. It's now. Um, wow, That's, it's, a, it's a, a very eloquent uh, call to arms. Um, I have a, a, a question on, on my screen. I'm not sure if you have any more on, on, on yours. No, we have okay. different screens, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I do have um, uh, uh, one of mine. It was, it, the question is, beyond Amazon, um, are there examples of companies that you would um, uh, call out uh, to us that you, you, you've come across um, that have put strategies in place that would fit the, fit the criteria you've outlined? I mean, there is a huge amount, right? There's, and, and that's part of the, the, you know, if we could, if we could, if we, if, if the number of companies that we're really taking action on this could be named individually, we'd be in trouble, right? There's, thought, thankfully, there is sufficiently larger numbers than that. So the UK obviously will host the climate negotiations now at the end of next year. And Nigel Topping, who's the high level champion, has put something together called the Race to Zero.
which is the attempt to galvanize momentum from all of the other societal stakeholders beyond national governments to support national governments with their own commitments that will end up becoming a kind of grand alliance of cities and states and regions and businesses and investors that all come together to push for that major outcome. And inside that, uh, it's worth looking at the race to zero. There is 700 companies that have met their quite stringent criteria in terms of are they really serious? Are they setting science-based targets? They have interim targets. Are they investing? Do they have, you know, all these other different things. So it's well worth looking at that and, um, and, and joining them if Barney Gifford is not part of that, although I'm sure you are. And, and can I just say, um, in, on those 700 who, and the list will get longer um, throughout the next 18 months for sure. Um, but I also wanted to say, some companies have understood that, um, that going to zero is not enough. And uh, they have taken on commitments to be climate positive, which means they are committed to absorbing more carbon than they emit um, and to doing so either into the future or uh, to make up for the emissions that they have historically. And there I would like to point out Microsoft and Ikea, both of whom have made very impressive commitments about, yeah, 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 we're, we're going to be climate neutral. We're you know, going to get to net zero. But beyond that, we have a responsibility here because the fact is that even if we get everyone, all of us he, individuals and all corporations and all governments to uh, the point of no longer emis emitting through fossil fuels, the fact is we still need to absorb beyond stopping emissions, we still need to absorb a lot of the carbon that we've put irresponsibly up into the atmosphere. We need to absorb it and put it back where it belongs, which is in the ground, soil, biomass, right? That's where the carbon originally came from. We've actually displaced it, right? And let's think about carbon as a very interesting real estate experience where location, location, location is absolutely the, the way to think about it. Carbon in the air is our enemy. Carbon in the soil is our friend. And so we do have to make an effort to not just stop our emissions, but also relocate the carbon from the air back into the soil, back into biomass, where it came from. And in as much as we can do both of those things, we will be able to stabilize environmental conditions. So that's why I really appreciate companies that are not just saying, yeah, we're going to get to net zero. That's a very important and critical first step. And you can't absorb more carbon um, than you've emitted before you do that. But that's not the end of the line. We will all be pressed eventually to actually move to that, to absorb more carbon than, uh, than we have emitted. Thank you very much. I'm um, conscious as ever of, of, of time on these uh, type of calls, and I've been told to keep it to a strict 45 minutes. Um, uh, it doesn't look, um, at least on my side, please tell me up on your side, if, uh, uh, if there are any more questions. So I encourage colleagues if they've got any um, burning questions in the last couple of minutes to please uh, put them in. Uh, now we are, there's my five minute warning. But um, I guess um, just one from myself um, that I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask. We've, you've spoken both separately on, on, on this webinar about the need for humility um, in approaching the um, task of what's um, uh, in front of us, both from the point of view of companies, from the point of view of um, organizations. And I, I, I guess um, no, um, for myself, I'm kind of wondering when, when you're giving um, talks about your book um, and you said you've done you know, um, almost 100 so far, what, what questions do you think that um, people ought to ask you? What aspect of your book do you wish that people would ask you about that, somehow, that, that maybe people don't get round to um, or that, um, yeah. That's a fun question. Have we ever thought about that, Tom? Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's um, I think in these, um, the, the, the nature of the challenge is, 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 is so immense that it, it, you can think of questions, but I sometimes wonder what you wish people would ask you. Um, yeah. huh. I'm stranded. Tom, can you think of something? No, I, I mean, I, I can't really. I mean, I think that the, the thing about this, this issue is that it's, 
it's so tempting to think that there's a way of like, and I know this isn't what it, part of what your question, but it's, it's so tempting to think, you know, oh, I, you know, there's this little switch over here. And if we just flick it, then, you know, we'll find the way to sort of like solve that problem in a way. And, and, the, and the challenge with climate change is it's such a different way of thinking because, you know, there's no military solutions to it. There's none of these big sort of like 20th century style solutions that you'd pile in and that's how you'd solve it. It's, it's, it's a sort of, you know, we could call it a network 21st century problem of everyone everywhere playing their part in a different way. So I think it's, it's um, there's no big missing piece that I can think of um, in answer to your question. Uh, it's, um, but, it's, 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 but it's that much more exciting for that. And that's why it requires all of us to show up in a different way and do something different. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, what is what is humbling about this, because you, you talked about humility, what's humbling about this is the complexity of it. Um, it affects all human endeavors. It affects all sectors. Um, and um, in a negative sense, but also all human endeavors and all sectors of human society can contribute to the solution, as well as all levels. Individuals, uh, communities, cities, corporations, the financial sector, uh, you know, governments, federal governments, national, subnational governments, everyone. So it's an everyone all in issue that honestly, we just don't have experience with because we are so much more used to silo thinking and silo working that this all encompassing approach um, is quite new to us. But is an approach that we have to cultivate because in the 21st century, more and more of our challenges are going to be of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so I often think of climate change as sort of our little uh, playground or our gym in which we're exercising these very, very new muscles that we need of understanding the complexity of this and not letting the complexity paralyze us. That's, you know, that's the, 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 the irony or the, the creative tension here is to recognize the complexity and at the same time, not deny, but at the same time, recognize the incredible agency that each of us as individuals have vis-a-vis -vis this complexity. Mm -hmm. It sort of seems like the two would not go hand in hand, but they absolutely do. Um, and that couched in the exponential context that we're talking about, which is going to be basically the, the, the trademark of the 21st century is everything is changing exponentially. So, you know, there's, there's too much going on. There's too many balls at the, uh, in the air at the same time. And this is all happening very quickly. And we're all kind of, you know, either looking down and putting our head in the sand because, oh my God, there's too much, too much. I'm getting dizzy. I can't deal with it. Um, or we're getting, um, yeah, into, into despair about, well, we're not, I'm not even going to make an effort. Um, and the fact is, it is an incredible invitation. That's the fun thing about this, right? It is an incredible invitation for us to launch what is actually going to be a very different human experience of engaging with economy, engaging with technology, engaging with finance. It's a very different way of thinking and doing and acting that is much more collaborative and certainly not siloed, certainly not isolationist. Um, and we're all being you know, forced, forced to do that. And so it's, you know, it, it's, I, I feel like I'm in a huge theater, a mega theater, the theater of humanity. And the, um, the stage is just beginning to be unveiled in front of us. And we're going like, oh my God, what a stage we have. Um, and the curtains are just beginning to be pulled away. So it is an incredible opportunity. So folks, step onto that stage because it is very exciting. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank you both um, very, very much indeed. That's been absolutely incredible uh, to hear both about your book and, and, and to be inspired and, and pushed ourselves, I think, really, uh, to, to, to try and um, both look at ourselves and what we do in our, in our, in our jobs and our role as uh, stewards of um, of. Uh, yes, other people's savings, but assets that can make a, a difference in the world. So um, I, I, I know that certainly I take that to heart. And um, I would hope that um, uh, I know that my colleagues will uh, as well. And we're very grateful uh, for your time. Um, the, the were a, there were a, a, a couple more questions, but um, I, I think we're probably 
out of time unless unless you had um, one minute more to, to deal with a very short one. You do have one minute more. Go for it. Go Tom for it. is right. going to answer it without knowing what it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the, 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 the brief question was, how do you see China's role in addressing climate challenge? Well, I mean, obviously, there's going to be so much tied up into that, right? I mean, you know, prior to 2015, it was amazing how the US-China agreement that brought, that solved so much in terms of the historical gulf between how developed countries and developing countries deal with emissions actually was the precursor that brought the whole world to Paris. And China was very ambitious. I mean, the grassroots press for cleaner and cleaner air had a major impact on them, right? Now, um, we're seeing a situation where climate is becoming a victim of international geopolitics and the way in which China is engaging with the US. And my sense at the moment from people I know who are much closer to the Chinese government is that we're entering very much a wait and see process until November. So China has, when they decide to get on top of this, enormous possibility and potential to go further and faster than people realize. And if you speak to someone like James Thornton at Client Earth, it's well worth listening to the podcast episode we did with him a while ago. He works directly with the Chinese government on the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and he is superlative about the, um, about the efforts that they're making and the degree of transformation that they're gonna drive. Of course, China being China, they're doing amazing, fantastic, wonderful things, innovative, shifting to electric. They're also continuing to build coal fired power plants and do a whole range of other things. So those two exponential curves are to some degree in competition with each other. And it is to no small degree, you know, <coughs> having the US play that role on the international stage of helping other countries and encouraging them to step up and find their better selves is incalculably powerful. And the corollary to that is it's been so damaging, that being absent. Poor I can Tom. see, <laughs> see really right. suffering there, Tom. Okay, we won't, uh, won't torture you any longer, but I, I think we all live in a hope about a, 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 a change in um, pace and leadership um, in relation to what you're talking about. So. Thank you again both very much and thank you to my thank you, uh, colleagues of, uh, who have joined us Bye. today. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye.